just before I get to the, the meat of it, I won't be here on Wednesday, so there will be no lecture. Don't, don't seem too pleased. I will remember you. <laughs> oh, is it just bad time? Something else, mate. Yeah, I thought it might have been. Um, there will be a problem class, however, and I think it's the last one of um, Prof Houston's. So thereafter, um, problem classes will be on the sheets that I'm giving out. The first one of which is on the back of your lecture notes. It caused enormous difficulty last year. I had students come out to me at the end of the course going, where are all the tutorial sheets? On the back of your lecture notes, so you won't lose them. It seemed to be a really big problem. So they're on the back of your sheets, and I'm going to persevere with it. Right, then on to today, <clears throat> or rather on to last time. We defined some terminology including what bias was and what signal was. <clears throat> and we said something about the differences between passive and active components. And then I introduced diodes <coughs> as an active component, the first one that we'll look at, and that it had a non-linear relationship between voltage and current. And more importantly than that, that it had several modes of operation which were distinct and depending on the bias that surrounded it unlike a passive component, which doesn't give monkeys in the way. And I said briefly that a diode is constructed from semiconductor materials, or from semiconductor and metal, but you would have heard that in more detail elsewhere. There are some notes knocking about somewhere. And we considered the effects of forward bias and reverse bias on the diode. And I gave you two linear models for a diode, that's to say not current is exponentially related to anode to cathode voltage, but it's either on or off, and it was either on at zero, or it was on past 0.7, past zero, strictly. And I said that the point of conduction was when there was 0.7 volts across it, but no current flowing through it, and that we come back to that this lecture, and we will. And I said that there were, well, it's not really three distinct states, it's off, on the point of, and conducting. Where on the point of is, is the, the, the infinitely thin part between the other two. 0.7 volts, no current flow. And I started off with a general method for solving diode circuits with a, a reasonably involved one, which would give you a good example on how to do some of the problem sheets. And at the moment, we're in the middle of that example. So this lecture, we will finish that example. And then I want to talk a bit about other types of diode, uh, including nice emitting diodes, anodes, and choppy diodes. And then, just a little bit, you seem happy if you spotted a spelling mistake. Why the hell are you happy in my lecture? <laughs> Would you like a biscuit for being happy? I was just looking at it. Like Say again? It looked like Scotty Diodes. Oh, right. Now it's a person's name. Do you want a biscuit anyway? <laughs> sure. Too early, no breakfast. Lots of alcohol. Very wise, sitting somewhere in the back where I won't see you. <laughs> um, so we do a little bit on time, the time dependent sources. So that's pulses and so on uh, in diode circuits. Um, and there's a whole tutorial sheet devoted to them, and if last year a lot of people had a big headache over this, if it gives you difficulty, I'll just drop an extra lecture in where we only do those until we can do them to death. But for the moment, I'm going to carry on as planned. We've got a few lectures spare, so if I need to add anything in, it's not a great difficulty. Um, so thereafter, when we get to number four, between between now and, and Christmas, all we will worry about is these five diode circuits. And then once we've done those, what I really need is five example circuits, which are pretty common, you can find in any textbook slash piece of equipment, and that I can examine you on easily. So it's pruned down to five from all the possibilities in the whole world. And we'll, we'll do these until Christmas, and once we finish them, we'll be done with diodes, and uh, come February, we'll be starting on transistors. So we were in the middle of this question about the case of whether this diode is conducting. We've replaced the diode with the 0.7 volt source, which is VD. 
Um, part B, for a further three marks or so, is what magnitude would V1 have to be changed to in order that the diode would be on the point of conduction? So what I'm saying is I've now I've got a variable which is uh, <coughs> question mark, but X would be more appropriate. And we've got the freedom to move X until we've reached this <coughs> on the point of conduction. Uh, for V. So what we're looking for is VD is 0 0.7 and ID is 0. Well, we can set VD at 0 0.7 because we've got a, that was a jolly big yawn, uh, voltage source and we can choose its value. And then we'll just have to adjust V1, V1 until ID is 0. So another way of working that through would be say, well, we'll make VD 0 0.7, we'll set ID as 0 and we'll do all the math backwards and we'll work out V1 which is how you actually do it. And we'll do that now. Everything else is the same, by the way. So, 1.7 volts across it, no current through it. Hopefully that'll be engraved on your brain before too long. Um, and we'll use C position, as usual. And we already know two things. We already know what happens <coughs> to ID due to V1, uh, I1, pardon me, and we already know what happens to ID due to VD, because when we did those calculations, we'd switched off V1 and we short-circuited it because we replaced it with its internal impedance, which was, which was? What? Infinity. Say again? Infinity. Try again. Zero. Zero, have a biscuit. <laughs> So being right half the time before I'm biscuit. If you want one. Yes, voltage sources get replaced with short circuits because that's their internal impedance as per prior lecture. So we already know that ID due to V1 has to be yeah, very careful. There's some Who's got some notes at the back? Throw them down. Yeah. Ah, excellent. Tutorial sheets are on the back. Thanks. No, problem sheet. Problem sheets on the back. Not tutorial sheets. Never. Edit that. Um, so we we know that um, ID due to V1 has to add up to these these two because this is what we've already got flowing as ID as ID. And we've got to make sure that ID is zero. So the ID that has to flow, due to the size of V1, <coughs> must add up to this lot. In order that, it will all count and we end up with nothing. And then we'll have 0.7 volts across the diode and no current in it, which is where we go on to head towards. So actually, there isn't nearly as much work to do for this bit as there was the last bit. But of course, if you can't do the last bit, you have no chance of doing this bit, which is how exam questions tend to go. Obviously, the first bit is considered easiest. So, the, last year I said such an easy question about op amps. Almost everybody thought I'd ask something else. Gave me a load of information they didn't ask for, and then they ran out of time. So, I might have to judge how easy I make the easy bits now. But um, anyway, you can get all the past exam papers as well. They're on um, the same website that the videos have gone and everything else. So, we know that the uh, the current due to V1 has got to add up to the line on the bottom of this slide. So that's really what I've said at the top of this slide. So now we're just working it out. We've got rid of the current source by <coughs> replacing it with its internal impedance, which is infinite. And we've got rid of VD, the voltage source that represents the diode turn on voltage, and replaced it with a short circuit, which is its internal impedance. And we are left with the calculation of V1 knowing that ID is now zero. And we'll say that ID is V1 upon R1 plus R3 because R2 is shorted. And that V1 is ID times the sum of the resistances. And we already know what ID is because it's, it's the thing that we had at the bottom of this slide. So that's where ID comes from there. And R1 is 100 and R3 is 10. And if you multiply it through, it's minus 28.4 volts. Minus because of the direction that I've got for the voltage source. If you go back to the prior lecture, one of the first things I did was switch this, the sign of the source by turning it around. 
The reason I put all the little tricks in this one is so that you can see them all. So that if you come to a problem and you think, I would, wouldn't it be nice if I could turn this source around, I wonder if I can, you'll be able to go back to this one and go, well, he did, so it must be all right. And then you'll do it and find the answer's not right and really worry that you haven't got it right. Um, so to yield 0.7 volts, forward bias across the diode and zero amps through the diode requires V1 to have the value of minus 28.4 volts. Before we finish up with this, is that consistent with what we found in part A? Now originally the, the voltage source was 30 volts and we had a small current flowing in the diode. I can't remember what it was, but it was quite small, now tens of milliamps I think. Um, so we've reduced the size of V1 or have we increased the size of V? Oh dear. Well, it's less negative than it was before, but I flipped it round, which is which positive. If you concentrate really hard, you'll find it is consistent. Reducing this source slightly acts to turn off the diode a bit, and turning off the diode a little bit is what we're after, because it was conducting, but not much. So yes, it is consistent. If it had gone up in value, uh, if the, the magnitude of this voltage had been bigger, it would have been inconsistent, and then you'd have known there'd have been a mistake, and you'd go back and find out where the error was. Which is actually a pretty important skill. If you can avoid panicking too much while you're actually doing the questions, you can save yourself so many marks by going back and just making sure. Right, enough of that. So there's a, the, uh, the problem sheet that's on the back of your notes is not to do with diodes. It is to do with everything that came before diodes and principally should be revision. Although, now that you get 117 and 118 together, you may find that you can't do some of the questions on there because you haven't been lectured on them yet. But, in older times, this was a spring semester thing and what used to be 117 was an autumn semester thing and I gave that one out because you have all of 111, well, it's 101 then. Um, so don't panic if you're struggling a bit with it, it will become clearer as time goes on. The next sheet will be about diodes. Moving on to other types of diodes, so we've got silicon PN junction diodes, what we've been describing so far, turn on voltage 0.7 volts, good for all sorts of signal applications, and also power supplies, rectifiers, that sort of thing. There are other types of diodes, including light emitting diodes, zener diodes, and shocky diodes. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about each of them. So, light emitting diodes are found in many applications, including indicators on equipment and in power applications such as room lighting. Not this room lighting, this is fluorescent lights. But in the not too distant future, it is quite likely that you'll be able to get the internet over the lights in the room. Because we'll put some really flashy LEDs in the roof and you'll leave your phone face up on the desk and we'll modulate the lights in the ceiling and it'll transmit the data to your phone camera. Maybe. Maybe. Don't know, it might not work, but we're going to give it a go anyway. So there are lots of, it's not just a case of a more efficient way of illuminating a space. Um, there are other benefits possibly as well. The question of how you will send the requests is tricky because obviously to get some data down you've got to send the request for some data and that will still have to be done some other method. We haven't figured that bit out yet. So the process by which diodes emit light is electroluminescence and shall I dare to draw a band structure? Will it mean anything if I do? Go on, we'll give it a go. Fearlessly, we voyage into semiconductors. If we... Nah, let's try again. <laughs> right, let's try again. Are you joking? Nearly, perseverance of a kind. 
Um, <coughs> so we might have something, some situation like this, and, and this will be k space, and this will be energy. And we might have something like this, I suppose, I don't know. And this will be our conduction band, and this will be our valence band. And all of our electrons will cool up here. But obviously, it won't just be one, it'll, there'll be other satellite valleys as well. Don't really know, this is almost silicon ish, really, really simplified. So, all our electrons end up pulled up here, and all our holes end up pulled down here. And if we're lucky, you'll get an electron and a hole recombining. And for that to happen, you need to drop this much energy. Oh, come on. This much energy. That much energy. So this will be an electron bolt, and you'll need to get this much momentum as well. And the momentum will have to come from, and the, you can't just accumulate one and hang on to it for a bit. You've got to get them together at the same place at the same time, operating on the same carrier. And that's very tricky. If you could manage it, you'd get a photon of light. Well, there are lots of methods of, of dissipating energy, but for the purposes of the argument, you will get a photon of light. <coughs> if you want to know what else could happen, have a look in Streetman. But, so you might get a, a photon out, which will have reduced HV as its, um, as its energy. But this is extremely unlikely, because you've got to get the phonon, which will give you the, <coughs> give you the momentum shift, and you've got to get the, uh, the energy drop at the same time. And that's highly unlikely. So this is for a silicon, uh, or indirect band gap. For the direct band gap, that's soft up there. For the direct band gap, we'll have energy and case space. Uh, and we'll have something like this, and something like that. Oops. And all you need now is some electrons up here to recombine with some holes down here. And there is no change in momentum, which is much, much more likely. So this is silicon, silicon carbide, and everything which is indirect. Indirect just means the highest maxima of, of a valence band, and the lowest minima of conduction band are not aligned in terms of momentum. Whereas direct band gap means they are. And in direct band gap, you don't need a phone on, you don't need any momentum shift to arrive at the situation where you can release energy into, as a photon. So you're much, much, much more likely to get a photon out of this end <coughs> than you are out of that one. This one being gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, everything you want, might want to make an LED out of. And the colour of the light that comes out is proportional to the amount of energy that the electron and hole will, will lose while recombining. Happy? Yeah, didn't kill you. So this process of, of um, getting carriers into higher energy states and then having them recombine to give our photons what's called electroluminescence. And if you want to know, I think it's in chapter four in street and it's all about uh, this sort of thing. That's more or less what I've said on the slide there. And more or less what I've said on that slide as well. The only other thing to say is that LEDs, are, LEDs obey the diode equation, but the, when you write the diode equation, I is equal to IS brackets e to the QV upon KT minus 1. Um, the IS is different. It's different for each material system. And it will yield a different turn on voltage. So if you were to buy a green LED, it might turn on 2.1 or 1.8 volts <coughs> instead of um, 0.7. And if you were to buy a gallium nitride LED, it would turn on about 2.3, 2.4. And more or less, the relationship between band gap and turn on voltage is more band gap, more turn on voltage. If you're interested in what materials give what colours, there's, um, the, there's a link at the bottom. And if you download the slides, it's a clickable link, so you don't have to cut and paste it or anything. So here's a graph of diode forward voltage drop against current at 25 degrees approximately. <coughs> this data is probably getting a bit old now and there's a lot of material systems that aren't on there. Nevertheless, it gives you some idea of, of what's going on. So silicon will be off the, uh, off the right hand edge. 
I'm oh, sorry, off, off the left hand edge. And in the simplest possible case, you would usually have a diode and a resistor and a power supply so that you could select uh, the current that flows. And uh, there's a circuit in the next slide, I think. Yes. Yeah. So this is a, a sort of made up question where I've crushed all the values. Obtain the forward current ID required to deliver the specified luminous output. You can get those off data sheets or LEDs. And the forward voltage drop from the device data sheet. The diode is conducting. You know it must be. I hope. If not, usual rules apply. Take away the diode, find out the voltage across the anode to cathode. It must be equal to V1 because the current in the resistor is zero. Current resistor is zero. Maybe. There's no circuit because the diode's not there. So there can't be any current. So the current in the resistor must be zero. So what appears across the end of the resistor, which is now no longer connected to anything, and the, uh, the return path must be equal to V1. Assuming we've made V1 sufficiently large to turn on the LED at all, it will be conducting. And I've said that uh, Vs is 24 volts. Yes, bottom bottom line. So this is a this is data taken from the GW5BQF 50K03, that widely known LED, which everybody loves. <coughs> um, and a year ago, or so when I wrote these, uh, you could pick them up for about £10.50. So this is a this is not the sort of LED that you'd want to put on off light for a guitar amplifier or something, it's, it's meant to illuminate a space. Um, so we'll do, not only is it meant to illuminate a space, this is not a single diode, it's many, many diodes. In fact, it's almost certainly something like uh, the one on the right, and there'll be a lot of them, and there's some of them will be in parallel with others, and some of them will be in series with the parallel sets. So you have five or six in series in parallel, and then you have series sets of five or six of them going up like that until you've reached um, either the voltage you want to supply, or uh, you want the voltage you want to be supplied from, or an arrangement which you find best for some other possibly even marketing reasons, possibly reasons of efficiency. So. We're saying Vs minus Vd is 24 minus 13, which is 11. So the voltage across R1 will be 11 volts. And then we use Ohm's law <coughs> and arrive at 18.3 ohms. And just to see how big, uh, that's physically big, the resistor has to be, we'll get its power of 6.6 .6 volts. This is the most awful way of driving an LED ever, but it is nice and simple. You would, if you were in a situation where you wanted to do a bit of room lighting, you decided to be all forward thinking and use LEDs, you wouldn't use resistive arrangements to get rid of the voltage you didn't want because there'd be lots of little orange spots in your ceiling where the heat of the resistor had got into the tiles or some such. You have some other arrangement involving some transistor switching, you'd be much, much more efficient. But, for the sake of argument, and just to show how you drive an LED under the simplest situation, this works very nicely. Zener diodes. I spoke briefly about them in the last, last lecture. And they are designed to operate in reverse breakdown. So we aim from the outset to make the cathode voltage greater than the anode voltage. And for this reason, we won't say positive and negative when it comes to talking about diode terminals, because you then have to ask what kind of diode. And the point of them is that they will break down at a particular voltage which is determined by the person who designed the Zenodiode to start with. And very, very briefly, very briefly, what happens is, how lucky do you think I'm going to be? Uh, pretty lucky. Um, Let's imagine a diode. Not that lucky. We get angry emails to the editor about the quality of chalk in this university. 
So we can have. Not I don't want. I don't like this. Can any of you actually see this? No, I can barely see it. I'm standing next to it. Maybe I'll try a different colour. Go for red and green. Anybody red green colour? Then I'm in trouble now. So this will be our our diode, and it will have um, we'll have a N region and a P region. So this is simplest possible case, and we'll have some external circuit uh, like this. Now I've got to think really hard about which way the battery needs to look. So it's reverse bias. So we've got minority poles up here going that way, and minority electrons going that way. Minority electrons want to get back to positive, so the battery's that way around. After all this time, I still have to sit there and go, which was the minority and which is the majority, and which is attracted to the other. It's the only surefire way of getting it right. Even though it doesn't always work. So, because we're reverse biasing this, we've got minority carriers that are doing all the work, and we've got minority electrons, which are so red, over here, and they want to get back to... What strictly happens is they recombine up here with a, minor, with a, a, majority, uh, a majority hole. They recombine up here with a hole, and um, then a current is induced, because the electrons don't end up in the metal. Well, okay, they could. But, what I'm saying is, the difference between a semiconductor and a metal other than all the other ones that are stated, is that in the semiconductor, it matters about the time that an electron takes to do something, and a hole takes to do something, because the electrons and holes are so far apart from each other, they, no, they're not actually far apart, they're really close together. What I really mean to say is their wave, function, their wave functions don't overlap <coughs> sufficiently. So what that means is, if you imagine a vacuum tube, you've got an anode and a, a simplest case, an anode and a cathode, and something that heats up the, the cathode to get electrons to leave the surface of the metal, and then you put a big voltage on the anode and it sort of sucks them across. And you could, if you were sufficiently well sighted, count them as, as they went. And if you said, all right, I'll turn on my accelerating voltage now, there would be a slight delay which you could measure, and that would be the time it takes the first electron to leave the cathode to get the anode. <coughs> that time of flight is important in a semiconductor and in a valve, but in a metal, as I said in the very first lecture, other than the fact that there is a medium-dependent constant, that's to say if it's copper, the speed of light in copper is not the same as the speed of light in vacuum, but other than that medium-dependent constant, when you flip the switch, the electricity is already there. Otherwise, if you lived a long way from a power station, when you flip the switch, there would be a big delay, which there isn't. All right, the, uh, the world is very small, the speed of light is very fast, the delay is minuscule, but everybody gets it at the same time. So we have to worry about individual electrons. You can count them across the barrier. There's also the reason that um, if you're worried about the noise in the resistor, 
the equation that you end up with is different from the noise in a semiconductor. Because in a semiconductor, it's a question of electrons crossing a barrier. The barrier being the, between the P and the N. But in a resistor, it's a different process that underlies the, the noise. Back to xenodiodes for a moment. Um, we will have some electric field involved. And the reason we'll have it is because this device is reverse biased. So as we reverse bias it, we'll have some, or just before we reverse bias it, there'll be some built-in field. Because we brought these two materials together, and when we did, the Fermi levels aligned, and there was some diffusion of carriers one way or the other to make everything constant. And that gave us this built-in field which we have to overcome in the case of silicon points and volts. <clears throat> in the case of the reverse bias diode, what we're doing is, when we put the voltage on, we want to make the built-in field bigger. So the, the built-in field is going to get bigger and bigger and take up more and more of the... So the, deplete, the depleted region might be just that bit in the beginning, when there's no bias, and we'll deplete more and more of it, of carriers, as we increase the field. Up to some point, where this, the uh, device will break down. That is to say, current will flow because the field is so great. Similarly, if you took, uh, well, if you think about an uh, automobile, you've got a, a thing that ignites the fuel air mixture in the cylinder, and what happens is, or well, right, what used to happen was you had a mechanical thing. that would charge up an inductor and then open circuit the inductor and an enormous voltage would appear to try and keep the current flowing and that would be put across the spark gap and there'd be a spark because the air would break down. It's the same breaking down that happens inside the xenodiode or any diode if you really upset it and put it in backwards. It's the same thing that causes the capacitor to blow up if you put it in backwards. It's a question of volts and meters. There are so many volts in your field and so many microns usually in your xenodiode and once you've exceeded some pre-written constant of the material, it will break down. And for, uh, well, for certain carbide it's about 2 megavolts per metre, for air it's about a megavolt per metre and for silicon I think it's about 30 kilovolts per centimetre or thereabouts. If you're interested, you can look at other tables of these things. Right then, don't worry, that's not examinable, not by me or by anybody. But if you've ever wondered, <coughs> that's how. If you want to know more about that sort of thing, you can try Z, I'm sorry, you can try uh, Streetman Banerjee or uh, the Physics of Semiconductor Devices by a guy called SMZ. The important thing to know for this course is that. We can use xenodiodes to regulate voltages. That's to say, if we wanted to make a power supply with a really, really fixed DC output, we would use a circuit probably involving a xenodiode, and before Christmas, we would look at some of those circuits. In fact, there, there's one of them. See? Promised we'd look at it. Um, So what I've just described is impact ionisation, where I sort of skirted around it. What actually happens is the carrier gets so much momentum that when it interacts with the lattice, it liberates several more carriers, and they get up a lot of momentum. That's to say their speed times the, times the mass. Um, becomes very great, and they liberate more carriers. So you can have one carrier liberate billions and billions and billions, and the result of these billions of carriers is a big current. So that's the same as saying your device is broken down because of large current flows. 
which is breakdown. Um, that is not, strictly speaking, the Zener effect. The Zener effect is... Okay. The Zener, Zener effect is a question of quantum mechanical tunneling. It's another effect where you have a very, very, very thin diode. So thin that as the electron approaches the barrier, there is a lot of doubt as to whether it's on the side that you're on, looking down at the barrier, in the barrier, or on the other side. Now, if I ran at the wall sufficiently quickly, and I was sufficiently light, quite unlikely I know, but if, just before I hit the wall and hurt myself, if I could go fast enough, there would be a bit of doubt as to whether I was in this room, in the wall, or in the next room. Uh, it's not strictly true because I'm really, really big and it only works with really, really tiny things and they have to be going really fast. But it's the same sort of thing. And that, that is the Zener effect. So what happens there is the barrier is really thin. So there's some doubt as to where the electrons are. And in fact, what you observe, when you observe the system, you, you bugger with it, really, um, which is some, an unfortunate consequence of how quantum mechanics works. So Zener diodes are truly Zener effect driven below about 4.3 volts because the, the region that we use to get the breakdown in quotes is not very thick. In fact, it's very thin. Above 4.3 volts is actually this case of impact ionization where a carrier liberates some more carriers which liberates some more carriers which give you enormous current. At about 4.7 volts, the two effects combine. And it's very useful because the Zener effect has a, a temperature coefficient. That's to say, the higher the temperature, the less or more this thing happens. And its temperature coefficient is one way. And impact ionization's temperature coefficient is the other way. And in silicon, at about 4.7 volts breakdown, they combine to more or less cancel out which means it doesn't matter what temperature your circuit's at, your Zener diode will be operating under more or less the same conditions within the realm of what's possible with silicon, which is sort of minus a few hundred up to 170-ish. And you won't get very good temperature uh, coefficient cancellation across the whole region of temperatures, but broadly speaking, for domestic situations where it's, you've got to put a human being near it and they mustn't die, it's about right, which is, is really handy. So if, you, if you're ever looking for a really stable voltage source, 4.7 volts is an excellent choice. I think that's more or less what I said on that slide. Very briefly, um, it's more or less the same as the LED situation. We know what the, Zen, we know what the breakdown voltage of the diode is going to be, so we'll say it's whatever I said I didn't. Well, 55C is the, the model, and 4V7 on the very bottom of the slide tells you it's a 4.7 volt diode. So if I made V1 10 volts, I'd know that the voltage across D1 would be 4.7. So I'd know that I'd have um, 5.3 across R1, and I could decide the current that flows in the diode based on the voltage across the resistor in the similar fashion to how I did it with the LED earlier. So there's no tricks, it's just diodes a bit different. Don't worry, I've got much less to say about shocky diodes. It's the combination of um, a metal and a semiconductor. So in the case of the PN diode, that's a semiconductor and so is that. In the case of the shocky diode, you might have P or N and a little blob of metal on top. And depending on the work function of the metal and the bag up of the semiconductor, you'll either get a rectifier or you'll get an ohmic contact. And you will cover that sort of thing uh, either in the other half of this course or in whatever 207 has been replaced with. So you can get different values of turn on voltage based on the work function level and the work function of the semiconductor. Usually they are quite application specific. You might want to use them in microwave circuits, for example, because the turn on is usually very, very, very fast. Also in high efficiency applications, if you've got 100 amps flowing in a diode, just say, 
Um, quite a big diode, and it's going to be like the size of this, maybe, uh, in cross section. And you have 0.1 volts across it, you'll dissipate 10 watts. If you've got 0.7 watts across it, you'll dissipate 70 watts. Now you'd much rather dissipate 0.1 watts. So in certain situations, really low turn on voltage is highly desirable um, because it makes it more efficient. And I've already said they're very fast. And there, there he is, Walter H. Schottke. Hopefully I spelled it right. So, enough of diodes, or types of diode. What happens if you put sine waves, or pulses, or whatever, into circuits that have got diodes in them? So this is it's the same sort of circuit as we had when it was a case of is it or is it not conducting. But now it's is it or is it not conducting across the full range of the sine wave input. So obviously the sine wave will first go positive, and then it will go negative, or if you prefer it will go negative first to make a difference. And we have to decide when it's on, when it's on, when the diodes are on and off, and, and what's going to happen. And we'd like to be able to draw some waveforms that say, at this node, you will get this voltage or current. And you'll be able to shade in the various regions to say, this is due to this diode being on, slash off, slash on the point of conduction. And this is due to such and such and so on and so forth, until you've worked out how it works. So I've got a, a reasonably simple example here. So this circuit is a voltage source, which is 10 volts P to P, which is 5 to minus 5. And it's driving two resistors and a couple of diodes, which are back to back. And I've given away what the output waveform is. So the output waveform is in black, which is V0. And uh, one diode is on half the time. The other diode is on the other half the time. And uh, the input voltage is the sign, which is in blue. So, what is it for? If I had this circuit on my desk, what's, what am I likely to be doing with it? Now, be careful about your answers. No biscuits or anything rude. Any takers at all. Definitely a biscuit or two in it. In fact, if you guess, I'll give you the whole packet. No? Ah, oh, never mind. It's a kind of limiting circuit, which is one of the simplest in a whole chest of wave shaping circuits, which will get talked about in whatever Triple E340 will be replaced with by the time you get there. Um, if I had a question on the exam script that said, describe the operation of this circuit, it doesn't matter if it's not this circuit, because obviously it won't be, but if I had a question like that, the length of this answer is more or less the length that's required, and the content of the answer broadly represents the content that would be required of any answer in that set. So, the voltage of the output is limited to the sum of the voltage drop of the forward bias diode and the voltage drops across the resistor R2. So if we just go back for a minute, that's the voltage across the D1 and a voltage across R2. And the voltage across R2 is proportional to the current that flows in it. So we can expect this voltage to go up and down. You see the black line, it does have a little in the middle of it. Provided the input voltage is greater than 0.7 or less than minus 0.7, one of the diodes will be conducting. Does that seem plausible? It certainly does. If neither diode is conducting, whatever you've got at the bottom of R2 will be whatever V1 is. So as soon as V1 crosses 0.7, a bit bigger than 0.7, one of those diodes will be in conduction. Just a question of which way the voltage is going. Is it up or down? So we still haven't really got to what I'm using it for. Any last takers? Yes? Is it something about analog to digital? It's a lovely try, but I'm afraid it's not. Although, in principle, I suppose it could be, because you'd say, uh, if you had many of them, you could stack them up, and this would be one level, and then it'd be two that would be the second level, and you could go for so many bits like that. That might be worth a biscuit. In the, in the interest of time, you can claim a biscuit at the end. If I put this in, wow, well, this never works. So frustrating. If I put in... Uh, 
Enoch. So that's what it's for, it's a, it's a distortion circuit. Um, and actually it's not that surprising if you were to FFT the signals before and after, you would be able to figure out that the diode equation has been busy at work on those signals. It doesn't look very nice to look at, so we always do it with sine waves, but that's what it's for. So we'll press on briefly. Here are the five diode circuits we've got. Peak detector, voltage clamp, <coughs> voltage multiplier, diode rectifier, which produces three types of power supply, and the zener diode voltage regulator. So that's that's our work from now to Christmas. And one of the most common applications of diodes is the conversion of alternating current into unidirectional current. That is not to say a constant current; it's a current which falls to zero from one direction and never goes in the other direction. So it doesn't necessarily have to be constant, just has to only ever flow one way. And these are often used to convert AC distribution systems into DC and there's a little map of the world which gives away which, uh, which countries have got which voltage more or less. And it's, it's generally, it's not that far out of date, let's put it that way. Everything in blue is about 50 hertz, everything in red is 100 hertz. And some countries are mixed, like Brazil and Japan. Brazil, half of Japan is on 50 hertz and half of it's on 60 hertz. And they have these enormous rooms sort of spread across the country where they convert the two frequencies. Heaven knows why. I think we'll talk about the peak detector next time because I don't want to rush it, otherwise you won't get it at all. So we'll stop there, no fair.